So I want to start my remarks, and I know some other speakers have, but I want to recognize that we are gathered on the banks of the Santa Maria River, just over there behind those trees. And it's in the territory of the Treaty One First Nations and the heartland of the Métis Nation. This is a place where Ojibwe, Cree, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Michif were and continue to be spoken. This river we're by has been a historic group for Indigenous peoples since time immemorial, and the land we are standing on forms part of the Métis Grant when Manitoba entered Confederation. Even the names of this place have Indigenous origins. Winnipeg, which came from the Cree, from Muddy Waters, and Manitoba, which has both Cree and Assiniboine origins. It's very important to me that we acknowledge and understand where we are <clears throat> and the Indigenous people who have been in these places since time immemorial. I also want to thank my partners and colleagues at Maurice Law who've been supportive of my CBA roles. A few of my partners are here, Steve Carey, Ryan Lake, and Cheryl Manichief, and my assistant Jennifer Campagna. They all came uh, from Alberta uh, to join me and I want to thank them for coming. I also want to acknowledge that there are a number of my colleagues uh, across the country who are watching this uh, live on Zoom. It's uh, when you have a firm where a lot of your colleagues are spread across the country, it is always so appreciated when you get to see them in person and even more so in these days of, of our pandemic. I also want to thank and acknowledge many of the esteemed guests who have taken the time to be here tonight, including Trish Rifo, the president of the American Bar Association who is joining us virtually. I've had the pleasure of working with Trish over the last year as we were both vice presidents and I look forward to working with her this next year. We also have Chief Judge Weeb from the Manitoba Provincial Court, Justice Horst from the Court of Queen's Bench, and Judge McKenzie from the Provincial Court. We also have Linda Troop, President of the Law Society of Manitoba, and Chris Dangerfield, the CEO of the Law Society of Manitoba here with us. Past Presidents, CBA President Guy Jobert is watching via Zoom, and we also have past Treasurer, CBA Treasurers Wayne Onchelenko and Dean Scaletta who are present. MBA past presidents are also here. John Stefaniak, Josh Weinstein, Ken Manzik, Karen Whitman, Sophie, Sophia Mirza, Melissa Beaumont, and Cynthia Lau. We also have the current executive of the Manitoba Bar Association uh, headed up by President Carly Owens with us tonight. As an aside, Josh and Ken, and uh, now Justice Scott Abel and myself, were all from the class of 1996, and all have all been MBA past presidents. To date, we have not been able to find another class member to be the MBA president, and I fear time is running out as we get older. <clears throat> I would like to give a shout out to Ken as he approached me years ago to run for the MBA executive, which played a big part in my deciding to follow the path to become the CBA president. <clears throat> While I entered the University of Manitoba Faculty of Law in 1993, I know Vivine wasn't gonna tell you when, but I just did. I think that my journey down this path started much earlier. In 1982, my late father, Rudy, put a copy of the brand new Charter of Rights and Freedoms on the wall of his home office. I was in junior high, and this was certainly a topic in the news and at school. Human rights codes were, were largely in their infancy, and the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry had started in Manitoba. Not many years later, we had Meech Lake and the Oka Crisis. Then we had the Charlottetown Accord. My interest was piqued, and any dreams of being a historian, teacher, or firefighter disappeared. By happenstance, I looked at the LSAT booklet and decided to give it a try. That led to applying to law school, then actually going to law school. It is hard to believe that happened almost 30 years ago. Certainly when I sat in the moot courtroom at the U of M in the fall of 1993, I never contemplated I would be president of the CBA. As Vivian said, I've been involved in the CBA since law school. I've been chair of both the provincial and national sections of the Aboriginal law sections. I've been on the executive of the former National Sections Council and I served as Manitoba Bar Association president for two years in a row. <clears throat> I won't call the person out who caused that, <laughs> but he is here tonight. The leadership opportunities made available for me in the CBA have been a blessing and I'm honored to have been able to occupy these positions throughout the Canadian Bar Association. I've made friends and contacts from coast to coast to coast. I wanna thank my many friends who are here tonight I am very happy that so many of you could be here. I wish we could have invited more people, but the pandemic has put limits on what we can do. I wanna thank all the people who are watching virtually tonight. I'm so happy to, that they were able to arrange this so that more people, including CBA board members across the country, branch presidents and others can watch. <clears throat> so this is the tough part. Um, some of you know about my family background. <clears throat> In 
in that I was adopted and then later life met my biological family. I don't have a family tree, I have a family bush. <laughs> Present tonight are my sister Val and her partner Denise, my brother Dwayne and his wife Deb, my brother Steve, and also my sister-in-law Vijay. I'm not sure if my brother-in-law is here or not. I didn't see him. He's not. Okay. <laughs> I also have numerous nieces and nephews present. When I became Manitoba president five years ago, I told the crowd their nicknames, but I will spare them that embarrassment tonight because we are time limited, but that is the only reason I am sparing them. <laughs> I want to give specific thanks to some of my family members. First, my in-laws, Sterney and Amelia Reddy. They're awesome people, even better grandparents, and have been very supportive of me. <clears throat> oh, this sucks. Um, <clears throat> Strini is my golf pro and Amelia spoils me with food, in particular Indian food with the South African influences, and I pity you if you have not been able to have that food. Next, my late biological mother, Yvonne Aldcraft. I wish she could be here today, and I, if I say much more, then I will turn into a blubbering mess. Um, what always amazed me is that in the time I was able to know her, sorry, can't do it. I also want to thank my late father, Rudy, as mentioned earlier, I think it was he who sent me down the legal path. And my mom, Anne. Oh. oh, yeah. Thanks, Jonesy. <laughs> uh, without her, I would not be where I am now. She's the best mom wonderful mother-in-law and an incredibly loving grandparent and her gentle nature makes everyone feel safe. Um, from grandkids to dogs, to cats, to horses, she's simply the best. Um, there's also my sons, uh, Sage, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, Kieran, uh, my gigantic 15 year old and Sanjay, um, I'm hoping he's here. Um, he's here, our, our curmudgeonly 13 year old going on 80 year old man. Um, I won't tell you their nicknames because I fear the wrath that I would incur. Uh, last but not least, of course, I have to recognize and thank the love of my life, Nalini Reddy. We met 17 years ago doing the lawyer's play here in Winnipeg. I was destined to become an ogre living in a swamp and this magical beauty <laughs> appeared as if out of nowhere and stole my heart. For copyright reasons, I won't say Shrek and Fiona, oh, except I just did. Um, I could not ask for a better partner in life. She's been so very supportive of all my forays in CBA leadership and I value her counsel over all others. Um, some say you shouldn't be someone who is in the same profession as you, but I think it's been one of the best decisions I have ever made. And the reason I knew that she liked me is because I discovered in Alini's culture of one, and she has her own unique culture, is that when she's romantically interested in someone uh, and you say something witty, she spits food on you. Uh, sorry, Annie. <laughs> I imagine you do. Um, <clears throat> and now onto the serious stuff as I wipe away tears. That's uh, great. Um, everything about 2020 has been unprecedented. The COVID-19 pandemic has charged the way we as lawyers and the justice system as a whole do business. We've had to find untapped stories of creativity to meet the challenges the pandemic has thrown at us. And we've had to do it at a speed most of us probably didn't think we were capable of. In the past seven months, the courts have undertaken the kind of modernization the CBA has been advocating for years. We've become masters of Zoom. We've discovered new ways to conduct, connect uh, with and to the network. We've become so accustomed to it and so good at it, we will probably never fully go back to the old ways. And that is a good thing. While there, the past can be a comfortable place for some, it is not for others. I am a member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Until the Indian Act was amended in 1951, it was illegal for Canada's Indigenous peoples to even hire a lawyer to fight for their land rights. Nearly 50 years ago, in my lifetime, Indigenous students had to renounce their Indian status in order to go to university. That meant they could no longer live on the reserve, vote for the chief and council, or inherit property. Reconciliation is the vehicle that takes us from the past to the present. present. In the words of Senator Murray Sinclair, reconciliation is about atonement. It's about making amends. It's about apology. It's about recognizing responsibility. It's about accounting for what has gone on. But ultimately, it's about commitment to maintaining that mutually respectful relationship throughout, recognizing that even when you establish it, there will be challenges to it. 
a great year reckoning this year has come with the protests that follow the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in the US, which have raised the awareness of systemic racism that exists in our country as well, and even within our profession. I need only think of Isha Hudson or Chantelle Moore here in Canada, which along with numerous other incidents have shown we have a major problem. And I'm very sick and tired of seeing young indigenous people being killed by police. I'm sick of it. Over the last week, <clears throat> over the last week, I've spoken about the problems which Indigenous peoples in Canada have with the justice system, and I intend to continue to speak about this while I'm president. This may lead to uncomfortable conversations and truths, but I remain steadfast that I will have these conversations. Without these issues being addressed, reconciliation will be very difficult. It will be an important issue for me this year. My podcast, Conversations with the President, will explore issues raised by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action with respect to the legal community. I am proud of the work that the CBA's Truth and Reconciliation Initiative has done so far, and I'm looking forward to working with them on future projects. A major issue that we've had to come to terms with this year, of course, is the pandemic. COVID-19 has disrupted entire economies. It has forced people to revisit or scrap business plans and life plans. We revise them and rework them in the hope that there will still be an opportunity on the other side of this pandemic. We found opportunities inside the pandemic, little silver linings inside a dark cloud. The CBA needed to cut spending in order to balance the budget this year. Online meetings and conferences meant we saved a lot of money on travel and hotels. It's not the same as being in person, but it nonetheless provides a measure of convenience to our members who can now attend a conference and still have dinner with their families. All of this pivoting and revising and reconciling ourselves to the COVID reality can be stressful. Some have described it as a hum of anxiety in the background that is sometimes louder, sometimes softer, but never goes away entirely. That kind of hum can sometimes get in the way of a positive outlook, can keep us from finding ways to turn challenges into opportunities. I believe that in this atmosphere, the CBA and the services it offers are more important than ever. Our networks may now be virtual, but they remain vital and active which is particularly important for young lawyers who need that support as they embark on their careers. Volunteers and sections have been brimming over with ideas for webinars and activities to provide support and information to our members. Our committee and advocacy work continues. Our COVID-19 task force will soon begin working on a report and recommendations for the modernization of the justice system, which is also the CBA board's advocacy priority for the year. Our equality subcommittee is working on gathering and creating resources responding to equality issues. CBA staff and branches and in the national office have worked hard to ensure we provide members with the information and resources they need. Our wellness programs are in place to help lawyers and their families when the hum of anxiety becomes overwhelming. I thank you all, volunteers, members, and staff for your commitment in very difficult circumstances. I would also like to recognize my fellow members of the CBA board of directors. Unfortunately, they are not able to attend in person. I look forward to working with you all in the coming year. First, I'd like to recognize CBA Vice President Stephen Rothstein of Ontario. Stephen and I worked together under the old CBA board model, and I'm very happy to work with him again. We've been able to get to know each other over the last number of years, and I am happy to be able to call him my friend. Our returning board members, Steve Bougeau from Quebec. Steve's will be chairing our policy committee. Chandra Flett from Alberta. Susan Gover of Newfoundland and Labrador. Susan will be chairing our audit committee. Bonnie Redekop of Saskatchewan and Mark Nuro of Nunavut. We also have a series of incoming board new incoming board members. Eden Alexander from Yukon, David O'Brien QC of New Brunswick, Jonathan Cody QC of Prince Edward Island, Brittany Scott of Northwest Territories, Susan Johnson from Nova Scotia, Melanie Mortensen of British Columbia, and then of course, last but not least, John Stefaniak from Manitoba. John, thank you for emceeing this evening. John is the chair of our finance committee. After allowing an Albertan and an Ontarian each one year to hold the position, I am happy to announce that the purse strings are firmly back in the hands of a Manitoban, <laughs> as they always should be. To all branch presidents, section chairs, and CBA national and branch staff, I'm looking forward to working virtually with you all and in person if possible in the new year. 2020 isn't the year many of us expected, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have to give, have something valuable to give us. 
I want to acknowledge the CBA interim CEO, Steve Pengelly. When our previous CEO gave her notice several months ago, my stress level began to increase and would require a search for a new CEO as one of the main tasks for me as the new president. Steve's name was one of the first ones that I considered. I had known Steve from when I was a Manitoba president and he was working at the Ontario Bar Association as executive director. I also had been working with him on the Governance and Equality Board. I always liked Steve and his cool, calm, collected demeanor. And I was aware of his past work in the Ontario provincial government. While he had retired from the OBA and was working his own private practice gig, including having his dog regularly walk in on Zoom calls, he took my call and I asked this massive favor. It didn't take long for him to agree. And in fact, his first words to me was, when the incoming president asks, you have to say yes. His wise counsel has been something of great value to me and I thank him for that.